Returning to the urban heat island, you'll remember that the urban heat island is a, an area of warmth that protrudes out of the, the rural countryside. It's an area that is warmer by a certain amount. Um, that temperature difference can be four, five, or six degrees centigrade. And at each of the extremities of the city, you have effectively a cliff where the urban warmth disappears into the surrounding rural countryside. Now, why this major concern about uh, urban heat? What are some of the impacts? Well, of course, there are the human health impacts. Uh, there's uh, issues around human thermal comfort. People lose productivity when they are too hot. They become uncomfortable and unhappy. Uh, there are transport issues. In uh, large cities, thing, you, you get issues such as rail lines buckling, tar seal uh, bubbling and so on that can cause transport uh, disruptions. Energy consumption goes up in heat. Tree health suffers, animal health suffers, violence increases uh, as heat increases in cities. Water consumption goes up and also urban warmth uh, has impacts on air quality. In particular, why the concern for humans? What is the issue here? Well, humans are in a constant thermal exchange with their environment. So there are, a range, there are a range of processes going on, convection and radiation and so on from the sun. That means that the, the, the body is in a thermal equilibrium with its environment. Uh, and if we have even moderate thermal stress, uh, that will impact thermal comfort, which is the level of satisfaction of the human mind regarding the thermal condition of the body and the surrounding environment. If you move beyond thermal stress to extreme thermal stress, that can cause illness or death. Uh, for example, uh, if the body core temperature rises above 43 degrees centigrade, it's fatal. If it drops below 25 degrees centigrade, it's fatal as well. In Melbourne, for example, we've identified a heat threshold for excess deaths in 65 year olds and over. And that threshold temperature is a mean daily temperature of around 30 degrees, which means a 40 degree day and a 20 degree night averaged across the day gives us a 30 degree temperature. We find that above that threshold temperature, morbidity, and that is people's de uh, the death rate of the population, goes up by about 17%. Now this is really critical and in a sense it provides a unique opportunity for us if we are able to cool the city because even a temperature drop of one or two degrees will have a major impact on death rates in the city. Professor Tappert has made special mention of people who are in vulnerable situations being particularly prone to health impacts of heat waves. And there's no better person to speak on this topic than Dr. Diana Edgerton Warburton, Chair of the Australian College of Emergency Medicine. As an emergency physician working in an emergency department, we um, approach heat waves as a serious disaster exercise. We know that over periods of extended um, heat um, health days that we will see a dramatic increase in emergency department presentations. Uh, not only will we see an increased number, but we'll see an increase in severity of the very sick and dying. Uh, and it puts immense pressure on the emergency departments. We have to work in circumstances often that are suboptimal during um, the 2009 heat wave. We had so many people coming in by ambulance uh, that in fact um, we couldn't close our doors and we, the whole emergency department heated up and the staff got uh, overwhelmed by the heat as well. Um, we know, um, so at Monash Health we approached it using a disaster model exercise and the, we had a lot of support from our hospital executives who actually opened a heat health ward uh, for the period of the heat wave and patients that arrived um, with heat health problems uh, were immediately sent to that ward uh, for IV fluids and recovery. But there was also a, a large number of people that required admission to the intensive care unit uh, who were very sick and a large number of people who died. Uh, we know that the ambulance service was uh, overwhelmed um, treating people with heat health problems. 
Uh, and we know in fact that the morgue and the coroner's court was also uh, overwhelmed. Uh, it is um, very frustrating uh, for the emergency clinicians because uh, with better planning uh, across the whole uh, of government, using a, uh, a cross-government approach to it, um, we think that a lot of these deaths and illnesses could be prevented. Uh, we know um, that um, it's largely seen as a health problem because we're, we end up uh, with the consequences of, of it and we have to treat the people that get uh, sick. Uh, but in fact, the prevention of it should really be a multi-system approach by government, by all levels of government. Probably the most important form of prevention uh, in the short and long term is um, by urban planning. Uh, particularly to address the urban heat island effect uh, which is responsible for a lot of the patients attending emergency departments that we see. Um, without that sort of uh, long-term planning and intervention to cool urban spaces, uh, we will continue uh, to see people dying and presenting to emergency departments. One of the things that we need to address uh, in this is the patients that attend uh, are often our most vulnerable people in the population. It's the very young, the very old, it's the people with mental health problems and other complex medical problems. That combination uh, is very lethal in um, heat uh, emergencies and results in a number of people getting sick and dying. Another person who has monitored the public health impacts of heatwave and the impacts of periods of long droughts is Rod Dedman from the Victorian Department of Health. During the millennium drought there was a high degree of uncertainty about the quality and reliability of our water supplies. Drinking water quality standards declined, food production slowed and industries were required to reduce production as a result of water restrictions. High quality drinking water, affordable fresh local food and employment are essential indicators of good health. The second issue was heat waves. In January 2009, heat wave in Victoria was of unprecedented intensity and duration with maximum temperatures 12 to 15 degrees above normal. Melbourne endured three consecutive days of temperatures above 43 degrees. Victoria's Chief Health Officer looked at the data for the week of the heat wave and compared it to the same period in the previous years. The results of this analysis showed that there was substantial morbidity and mortality related to the heat wave. The most significant finding was that there were 374 excess deaths over what was expected. The third issue relating to health that became evident during the millennium drought was the impact of dry weather on the quality of recreation spaces used for both formal and informal physical activity. There have been numerous studies undertaken about the contribution of public open spaces on the promotion of health and well-being. The University of Western Australia's Centre for the Built Environment and Health, for example, has published substantially on this subject. They have consistently shown that access to quality parks and gardens, linear green corridors linking key destinations and sporting facilities are highly correlated to the take-up of physical activity, in particular running, walking and cycling. It was hypothesised by many academics that physical activity declined during the millennium drought as a result of the decline in the quality of public recreation and sporting facilities due to water restrictions. Lifestyle diseases such as obesity and type 2 diabetes placed a significant burden of disease and cost on Victorians. Quality Purpose designed places are needed in all climatic conditions to achieve the physical activity needed to lower rates of these lifestyle diseases.